but it was a wake up call. And I never, and I've done many plays since, that fear's never left me since. Well, talking of that brings us on to your, your second failure, which is in 2001, and you were on stage in New York in Pinter's celebration. Yeah. And your mind blanked. Well, I, we'd done the play at the Almeida celebration. Fucking amazing piece of work. And that's how you met Harold Pinter yeah. in the first place, isn't it? Because yeah. you auditioned And he for felt that. that he discovered me as well. He used to tell everyone, I used, you know, you know. And I'd been, I'd been acting for eight years up to that point. But anyway, it's a great part. It's the part of a waiter. So throughout, it's it's set, I don't know if you've ever seen it, this play. No. It's set in a restaurant and it's two tables. So it cuts from one table, quite vulgar people, to another table with this couple that are on a date with Leah Williams and Keith Allen's in it and Lindsay Duncan. And, and I'm the waiter. So I come on with plates of hot food, but I interject into their conversation and I ask them if they was talking about, um, you know, D.H. Lawrence. And they go, no. And then I go, oh, my grandfather knew. And I go, I know these big monologues. So basically, I have to interject. And then they'll look at me and go, oh. And then I have this massive speech about this absolute bullshit about how my grandfather was friends with these certain poets and writers and stuff. But um, anyway, I'd, I'd never been to New York. And so when we transferred from the Almeida to the Lincoln Centre in New York, I got very excited. Well, And uh, I took a lot of drugs out there. And I felt because I'd already done this play, you know, and I'd never, and this is the other thing, I'd never dried. I take it very seriously in my work and I love it. And I always strive to be better every night. And, you know, I'd never got in a situation, I'd heard about people that had dried on stage, you know, because it's a massive thing and all that. And it had never happened to me anyway. I thought that I could sit up all night smoking crack and then walk on stage. And of course, you can't fucking do that. It's a ridiculous idea. And, um, and, I, and I interjected like I'd done, you know, many, many nights before, you know, like I've done this place so much, matinees, and I just, I didn't have a clue what to say. And the worst thing was the other actors who knew I'd been out looking at me because obviously, so the audience is there, they're facing that way. I come behind their little bonquette thing and I interject and they all turn to me. So their faces are away from the audience and it was just their horror as if to go, come on in, prick. And that made me worse, because I thought, oh shit, actually. And I'm, you know, I'm not just letting myself, I'm letting all that I like, because it must be horrible if you're in a scene with somebody, and it, you know, you're doing your bit and it's going well, and they dry, because then you're fucked, because they're fucking you, aren't they, as well? It's like, okay, how do we get out of this situation? But yeah, I just remember thinking, being very aware of what I'm doing for the first time ever, questioning it, going, oh my God, what? Oh my God, I, everyone's looking at me, waiting for me to speak. I'd never had that feeling before. I loved showing off. And then all of a sudden it's like, so my lips started to go because I was going to cry. So I thought, you know, obviously because I hadn't been in bed, felt really vulnerable. And then Andy Delator shouted the line out and I snapped into this and I did it and I, did it, and I said it. And then, and then I have to go off stage because I have to come back on again in a bit, and I come off stage going, I can't go back on, I can't, I just, this was a major, major panic attack. But I just had to get on with it. I thought, fuck you, you put yourself in this situation, now get on with it. You know, and even when Keith Allen's looking at you going, fuck you, hell, mate, you know, you know you're in trouble. And then Harold came up to me after, and he sort of gave me a cuddle, and that made me worse, made me cry, and I was like, mm. and he went, if ever there's an ensemble piece, it's this, Danny. And I was like, yeah, fuck me, I'm sorry. But it was a wake-up call. And I never, and I've done many plays since, that fear's never left me since. So, you know, I carried on, did the play, shat myself every night. I never really used to get fear. I used to just be a bit impatient waiting to come on. You know, if I wasn't the lead in the play, you know, you sort of come on and on off. And I did the homecoming. That was, I was like, I can't wait to get on and show off. Then I had this other thing of like, oh God, can I do it? Is it going to go wrong? And that never left me. So I did No Man's Land after that. We went on tour with that for six months with Colin Redgrave and John Woods. Shat myself every night. I, and then my, the last play I did was The Dumb Waiter with Martin Freeman. And we did that. And we closed the, the Pinter season at the, um, at the Howell Pinter Theatre. And, and that's a two-hander called The Dumb Waiter. So I never leave the stage at all. Shat myself every fucking night. Waiting to go on. 
And I think I think you know you, you need it because it makes you feel like you're not bulletproof. And that, and it was my own. I inflicted it on myself, but it was a major foul, and it was something that um, that I really did learn from. You know. I think you've really conveyed that sense of terror oh. and shame incredibly well. Though. Oh, it was awful. It sounds I, it. I've never felt that feeling before. You know, and then having to just go back on stage and face the fear and do it anyway. What was your relationship with drugs after that moment? Did it did it change that? It did for the duration of the play. But I'm not doing that again. Of course, I'd have, you know, it's still quite a tricky, you know, many years of it after that. Do you know what I mean? I went to rehab in 2016. I'd, it'll just become too much for me. I just lost the sense of who I was and I think that I just needed, I just knew I needed to change something in my life drastically. And so I took it upon myself and I think most people that do go to rehab need to take it upon themselves to go and go, I need a shift because if you're forced into it or there's an intervention, it doesn't necessarily work. If you're forced to go to a place and be committed to a place, which is a psychiatric unit essentially, you know, you, you need to be there when you're on will because otherwise you'll just go back to doing what you were doing, really. And I think that was a big moment for me, you know, because because I put everything into my work and it, and, and, and then and I thought I was quite good at it, well, you know, and how dare I be in New York on Broadway doing a play anyway, and then I thought, oh, no, I fucked that up now. I'm quite good at pressing the fuck it button for many years. And when I had a lot of therapy in rehab, I realised it did go back to abandonment issues of strong male figures in my life. Like my dad left, that fucked my head up. Then I became really close to my granddad who died of cancer when I was 16. Um, you know, like six months he got prostate cancer and then I nursed him um, uh, and he just fucking deteriorated. Like It was like, wow, this big, strong fucking man. Who Then we had to put a bed in the living room and he couldn't get up anymore and he had a little bar and I had to... You know, you had to piss in this fucking thing, and it was so that done me. And then, and then Harold came into my life, and then he died of cancer. And I felt that, and I think that I learned from. Well, I thought, I thought, well, I, I'm just going to fucking press the fuck it button before they die on me, or, you know, I, I'll beat them to it. That's what I learned in therapy, and you know, a lot of therapy, and, that, and that's what I sort of, you know, it was abandonment issues mm. from from mal from mouths. I hope you enjoyed that video. Be sure to check out the full episode of How to Fail wherever you get your podcasts. And also make sure you're following us on social media for all the latest updates.